We're going to jump right in this morning. There's, there's a lot to cover. I'm excited about what the Lord has in store for us today. Men and women of God, let me say something. Your posture in this world, especially for the times that we're in, is extremely important. I can summarize this entire message with one word, and it's called posture. One question, what is the posture that you're taking? We're continuing in our sermon series, If God Only Knew, part eight. It was supposed to end with part six. But the Lord keeps adding to this, and it's great stuff. As we know, Joseph went down into Egypt. In other words, he had to go through a lot in order for the dream that was here. You know, so oftentimes we have dreams for our lives, dreams for the benefit of others. Remember, a God dream is never just for you. The God dream that God gives you is going to bless others around you. It's so important that we get this, but so often we just see the culmination of the dream and we don't realize sometimes we have to go down, sometimes we have to go through. We don't see, right, the gap between the dream and the time of its fruition. And there's a gap. There's a seed that's planted, and there's, there's a condition of the soil, and there's things that it has to go through. So Joseph went down into Egypt, Last week, we talked about he had the ability to see into others. Church, we can't miss this. It's important for us to have the ability to see one into another. It's prophetic. It's eyes that look into the windows of the soul. It doesn't mean if you have a log in your own eye, right? Jesus talks about that in Matthew chapter 7, then why are you trying to call this one out in me? No, that's not what he's saying. We should know and we should recognize brothers and sisters in Christ who are going through a certain time in their life, a certain season in their life, There's some struggles. They, they know what they've seen in life, but life has not become what they hoped it would be. Tragedies, different things, disappointments, many with different addictions today. And we should be able to look into that and say, hey, Jesus is here for you and can deliver you. Today, we're going to see just how strong God truly is in Joseph's life. Matter of fact, Joseph basically says, I don't move unless God moves. And then the ability to serve one another is always important that life comes full circle. Isn't it cool what we just heard from Darla? I don't even have to teach on life comes full circle because she's showing right there, if you live long enough, if you persevere in the Lord, he's going to show you a miracle. He's going to show you that he is there, that he is in the midst of all of this, that this cannot be coincidence. Life comes full circle, and it does for Joseph as well. Joseph, last week we found out, had to interpret basically a couple of dreams, or he had the opportunity to interpret one from the cupbearer and the other one from the baker. And, and if you remember, one would go well and one wouldn't. He said, hey, uh, you know what, Cupberry, you're about to be restored, but here's the problem. Uh, the baker was like, well, that's pretty favorable. What about my dream? And he goes, oh, um, you're going to lose your head and be impaled. Here's the good news. You got three days to repent, right, and find my God. But anyway, um, and then Joseph tells the cupbearer, when you get out three things, remember me, mention me, and get me out. And I ended last week with those three things because they're very important in our prayer life. We need to uh, remember one another. When it says mention me, we need to mention by name before our God, before our king. And then finally, get me out or deliver me. So many people have addictions today from pornography, which is one of the greatest addictions, hidden addictions in the United States and around the world today. Even in Muslim countries, they're finding this is becoming a huge, huge problem. And so how do we get delivered? Well, we look into one another's eyes and, and we remember them and we mention them by name and we ask God to deliver them, but also those who are hurting, those who are walking through pain. We talked about offenses three weeks ago, the importance of not being caught by the scandal on, by the bloody bait. And Joseph kept his heart pure, and because of that, God could work with him. Today, in chapter 41, in order for time purposes this morning, let me just tell you what happens. It begins by saying, when two full years had passed, Pharaoh had a dream. This is where we're going to be today, all right? And for time purposes, let me catch you up. No one could interpret the dream, the cupbearer at this time, two years later, oh yeah, there's a young Hebrew that might be able to interpret the dream for you, Pharaoh. So he begins to uh, tell him, hey, uh, bring him up. And let's start there. If you'd please stand for the reading of the word 
of God this morning. Verse 14 of chapter 41 in Genesis. So Pharaoh sent for Joseph, and he was quickly brought from the dungeon. When he had shaved and changed his clothes, he came before Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream, and no one can interpret it. But I have heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. I cannot do it, Joseph replied to Pharaoh. But God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. You may be seated. I want us to first look what Joseph does before he goes in front of Pharaoh, the king. This is so important because he's about to go in front of Pharaoh before the king, and the Scripture says that he does two things. Now, when we read this, we'll just jump over this, and for some reason over the last three weeks, this has just been jumping out at me. Why did Moses put this in here? Why did he write this? Why did he make it a point to say he changed his clothes and was shaven? What was going on here? He understood something, the importance of first impressions. We live in a culture today that that feels as though if I have to go before an interview, I can look however I want. I can dress however I want. I can say whatever I want. They can either hire me or not hire me. I really don't care. As a matter of fact, if you knew the truth about me, I should be sitting where you are. That's how good I am. So I don't have to dress for the occasion. I don't have to dress for success. I don't have to. And, and what happens is we don't think about first impressions and the, por- and the importance thereof. See, you only have one chance to make a first impression. If you are allowed to come back, well, listen, that is a second impression. Joseph understood the importance of this, and most importantly, who he was about to stand before. He was about to stand before the king, before Pharaoh. And there's no way he's going to do that in an un- unworthy manner, with an attitude, with a, I didn't belong in the dungeon. Shoo! I didn't belong as a, as a slave. I didn't, I, I was never, I should have never been sold into this. I should have never been beaten up at the times that I was beaten up. I, I, I should have, this life has been unfair to me. Pharaoh, I don't care about your king or your kingdom or who you are. Listen, I can interpret your dream and you can take it or leave it. That's not what he said and that's not what he did and that's not how he approached Pharaoh. You see, how would a king take a person who doesn't respect him enough to clean up for his presence? This is important. When we go before our king, what's it look like? Do we come with a prideful heart or a humble heart? Do we come in in all that we know and all the things that we've been through, and do we wear our scars in front of him as though he didn't have any for us, as though he didn't pay the price? You see, Joseph got himself ready for the king. And part of the ways that we do that is through having a heart of repentance, A heart of saying, hey, look, where I am today is simply because sometimes the choices I've made, and hopefully I'm in a good place because my choice is Jesus and his purpose and his ways for my life. Joseph understood in order for him to prosper, his God had to not only be in him, but before him. See, at at this time, Joseph wasn't identifying as a prisoner, as a slave, as a victim, but as a man on purpose for a purpose. He's saying, look, God is about to put me in front of the king, and because of that, I'm going to go in a worthy manner. I'm going to present myself well. You want a promotion? Listen, learn how to present yourself well. This is important. Too many of us carry our baggage into life and before those who have the opportunity to really promote us in life, and because of that, we're not promoted. We have to be careful with what the culture is screaming at us, saying, you be you. Well, what is you? I mean, really, can you not be bettered? Can we not learn a life of excellence? Years ago, I had a a great aunt of mine, aunt of mine. <laughs> I didn't realize that's a word. Anyway, I had a great aunt of mine, and she loved me. And one day she came to me and she said, Curtis, how come you don't preach in a suit and tie and bring God his best? Whoo, I got offended. Oh, my goodness. I went and I dwelled on that, and I just, 
I, I tell you what, I prayed over that and, and I rebuked her over that. Not, not to her face. She, she was from the tough age. I'm not messing with them, but you know, she told me and, and you know what she wanted for me was the very best for me. She wanted me to succeed as a preacher, as a pastor to the culture that I was preaching to at the time. Look, how we present ourselves speaks a lot about our posture. And church, I'm here to tell you that godly posture, not prideful posture, but godly posture will take you far in life. It does. Think about how you present yourself today. Is God your witness? I scroll, if I scrolled through your reels, through your Twitter, through your Facebook account, whose kingdom would it promote? Joseph could have been the bad boy here. He could have represented himself in this way. Look at these scars. I got this one when I was in the cistern. Mm -hmm. These across my back is when it, it was what happened to me when I was sold into slavery. Check these out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is what Potiphar did to me right across here when I was falsely accused. Church, his scars did not define him. His God defined him. You have to be defined by your God, not the old man. In the, in the New Testament, this is referred to as the old man. This is why Jesus told Nicodemus, unless you are born again, this is why the Apostle Paul tells the church at Corinth, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things have passed away. We're not celebrating those anymore. We're celebrating our God. You know, he had the scars to, share, to show where, what he had been through. There's no doubt the obstacles that had come in front of his dream, but he didn't brag about what he had been through. He knew these things were not his identity. They may have prepared him for his future in God and what his calling was and what his dream was, but they were not his identity. There's no doubt that Joseph is tough and he's learned how to be and become tough through what he's gone through, but it does not define him. Church, careful where this culture will take you. It's going to tell you that your past defines your future. The culture is going to tell you you are only the culmination of the choices that you make in the bad way. You need to show everyone that you're a victim. Life's not fair. Life's not equal. It never will be. Golly, there's a reality for all of us. It's not fair for them to have this and me not have it, for them to go there and me not get to go there. For me, forget it. Church, care for where, where the culture will take you. Today, many don't care how they look when they go for a job interview, much less what others may think. You see, many are so proud of the poor choices they made that they want to celebrate the old man more than they want to celebrate the new in Christ. That was never Joseph. He never even brought those things up before the king. The culture states truth belongs to the one who yells the most or the one who yells the loudest. The culture states it's my body, I can do as I want. It's my gender, I can choose what I want. It's my marriage, I can live it out with whom I want or not even call it marriage. It's my right to have what you have. It's my life, I can live it how I want to. It wants you to worship the creation more than the creator. Read about that in Romans 1 and how well that goes for people. That's the culture, and that's what it's crying out and saying, here's who you are. Let us form your identity. Let us tell you who you are supposed to be. When Joseph said, all of this stuff in my past means nothing. I'm standing before the king. My heart is pure. See, whose kingdom are these statements about? Does this posture represent one of our Lord or does it represent more of something about us? The culture will always want you to find value in, in the purse that you carry, in the dress that you wear, in the lipstick that you put on, the earrings that you wear, in the eyelashes that you buy. The culture's going to tell you. And listen, listen, women, the culture speaks to you as well.
That wasn't in my notes. You just got that one for free. No, I'm just kidding. But here's what God did. He created you as his most valuable creation. You were created in value with a valuable purpose for a dream that God so wants to sow into you as well. Joseph wasn't going to squander this opportunity before the king. He knew the opportunity of a lifetime only lasts the lifetime of the opportunity. We say that a lot here, but it's so important. Present and posture yourself well. Oh, church, if we could get this. Let me key it down a little. The author here, Moses, made it a point that we understood that Joseph took no chances when it came to going before the king. He didn't have to put that in there. I thought that was just something, that, I don't know why that's even in the Scripture. Who cares if he say? Who cares if he changed his clothes? Well, obviously Moses thought it was something worth caring about. See, he wanted to represent not only himself, but he understood he was a representation of his God. And he was not going to squander that. He wanted his God seen on his reel, on his Facebook, on his Twitter. They didn't have it back then, I'm just saying No matter what his circumstances were, he wanted excellence before the king. To show him, he served an excellent God. He knew his posture before man would be very important and may be a way to advance God's kingdom. Uh, Years ago, I had a young man that uh, we we were interviewing several for a youth pastor or youth director, actually, at the time. And uh, a young man came in, and he had man, a short sleeve shirt on, and he had on shorts, and man, he was buff. I'm talking about this boy was like this, you know, and he had his tats all on, and he he came in there, and he sat down across and just kicked his, not his feet up on the table, he just kicked back like this, and uh, and so we kind of explained to him about the church, and we were excited about him being there and, and all this other stuff, and he had success in, in some youth ministry. I'm, I'm not going after that at all, but uh, then he said, how, I mean, we didn't even get five minutes of conversation. He wanted to know how much the position paid. And I said, well, we'll talk about, you know, the, the finances later. And as we, SBRC, or as we were sitting there as a committee and a team interviewing him, we had a few other questions. We ran by him, and he finally said, look, I can make this real short. If you don't pay $60,000 plus, i am not interested. And I was like, what kind of posture is this? There's no humility. There's... How do you think, I finally said, it's not even worth a tour. You go on about your way, right? We've got a young man right now that's an engineer that has chosen a lot less money to come and lead our youth out of humility. And I don't know if there's a more humble man than Matt. And when I look at Joseph here, I see a humble man. His God has given him a huge dream. This is about to be the most successful man on earth. And yet, he's so humble, and and his posture is a correct posture in order for God to work through him. Genesis 41, 15, Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream, and no one can interpret it, but I have heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. And Joseph immediately said, I cannot do it. He replied to Pharaoh, but God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. Verse 17, then Pharaoh said to Joseph, in my dream, I was standing on the bank of the Nile, when out of the river there came up a huge Nile crocodile and ate me. That's not what it says. I'm just trying to keep you with me. There are some huge crocs on the Nile is what I've heard. But when out of the river there came up seven cows. That's kind of odd, isn't it? Fat and sleek, and they grazed among the reeds. After them, seven other cows came up, scrawny and very ugly and lean. I've owned those. I've never seen such, this is funny too, I've never seen such ugly cows in all the land of Egypt. Verse 20, the lean, ugly cows ate up the seven fat cows that came up first. But even after they ate them, no one could tell that they had done so. They looked just as ugly as before. Then I woke up. I didn't wake up from my dream. Verse 22, in my dream, I saw seven heads of grain full of good growing on a single stalk. After them, seven other heads sprouted, withered, and thin and scorched by the east wind. The thin heads of grain swallowed up the seven good heads. I told this to the magicians, but none of them could explain it to me. See, let's get some application going on here. Many of us, I want us to see, so many times we try to man up through life circumstances and situations. And what we're beginning to learn is I can't. 
Okay, and you may say, well, what does that have to do with these dreams? A lot here in just a moment. We're frustrated, we're downtrodden, and we're simply finding ourselves in this place. If God only knew how hot, how dry. I took a picture of our thermometer yesterday, 111 degrees. (laughs) And the wind was blowing too. Some of us say, if God only knew, right? But this is why we have God's word. It is such a gift to us. God does know, and he speaks to us in these ways. The first thing Joseph said when when Pharaoh said, I heard that you can interpret, he said, no, I can't. It's okay, church, to admit that you can't. Just because you can't shouldn't mean that you are defeated. Peter stated in Matthew chapter 26 in the New Testament, Speaking to Jesus in verse 33, even if I'll fall fall away on account of you, Jesus, if I'll fall away, I never will. Truly, I tell you, Jesus answered Peter, this very night, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. Verse 35, but Peter declared, even if I have to die with you, I'll never disown you. And all the other disciples said the same. We tend to miss that, right? And what happens? Peter disowns him before the chapter ends. Our strength in life, in our own selves, is very limited, church. But in Christ, all things are possible. Now, back to Joseph. Joseph couldn't do it on his own. He told the other prisoner, when you get out, remember me, mention me, and get me out of this prison. In other words, Joseph understood he needed help. He even needed man's help to some degree. And he tells Pharaoh, look, I can't interpret your dream, but I know the one who can. I told the pastors, the this past week in our pastor's meeting, I said, you know, one of, one of my mentors in life was Richard Bells, and he told me something that I've never forgotten. Early on in ministry, he said this. He said, Curtis, if you're swimming in ministry, you're doing good. And if you can swim, that's great. But he said, you'll be a lot better pastor when you learn to drown. When you understand that in ministry, it's going to overwhelm you at times, and you're going to be drowned, and you'll be a better pastor because you'll call upon the name of the Lord. And he's been true. You see, the scripture says God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. And we've seen how Joseph has served. He's a very humble man because the most humble among us serve the most. That's just how it works. So the first thing is Joseph can't, you can't, I can't. And the second point is we can't. Joseph stated in verse 32, the reason the dream was given to Pharaoh in two forms is that the matter has been firmly decided by God and God will do it soon. This is going to be a God thing. Church, if you haven't heard, there's a storm a coming. There's a storm a coming. I mean, this is going to be a God thing and God's going to have to deliver us. I'm not attempting to set you on fire with fear and I'm leery of bringing a distraction uh, from the gospel with current affairs. But the answer to all of this, to to everything, will always be God, and God in us, and God with us, God among us, and us recognizing the strength of our God. Because the world is trying to say getting out of debt will will happen through spending more. It won't work that that way, right? The the world is trying to convince us that the answer to a border crisis is, is to open it wider, that the answer to social justice is abortion. The answer to not repeating history will simply be not to teach it. The answer to feeding more, look, will never be through growing less. And yet we're paid to grow less, but we have so many more to feed. We don't need uh, oh, I, I put this in here just over something that I saw this week. I saw a commercial, and I don't watch but very little TV. As a matter of fact, probably less than 30 minutes, maybe, a week. I don't know. I don't watch much, but a little commercial comes on, and as I'm watching this commercial, it's got a little girl, and she's about this big, and basically this is what she said. She said, we don't need to follow history in this country. We need to make it. And, and I bet she wasn't five years old. I'm like, what are we teaching our children? That's the wrong posture because that posture will not be recognized by our God because our God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Posture will always promote your position, church. 
So Joseph has good posture. He listens to God. He interprets the dream, and now is given the opportunity to speak. And finally, in verse 33, and now let Pharaoh look for a discerning and wise man and put him in charge of the land of Egypt. He's not trying to self-promote. He just knows what he's supposed to say at this time. Now, most of us would say that Joseph, looking at this passage, is looking for self-promotion. But Joseph is not about self-promotion. He's about God promotion. And so this interview is now going very well. And he maintains his confidence and a humble posture before Pharaoh and his God. And God is getting ready to promote him to his next position. Listen, church, posture will promote your position in life. If you have the correct posture before God and before man, you will be promoted. I see it time and time throughout Scripture. A verse uh, or fourth point, what to say and when to say it. You've got to know what to say and when to say it. And this is what's cool because Joseph has been with his God and now he's given the opportunity. Now he looks, I mean, obviously Pharaoh's saying, man, this young man's got it together. This man's got something to say. This man does have a God and this man's hearing some things. So not only is it about his posture about to promote his position, but he knows what to say and when to say it. Many times I, I've known just what to say. The problem is I didn't have the mic to say it. <laughs> Many times I've known just what to say. I didn't have the confidence to say it. Many times I've known what to say, and the Lord said, I'm not giving you a mic. You are dangerous because it's more about you than it is about God. Many of us listen to reply instead of listening to understand. It's a danger in this culture today. We don't right realize it when our time comes, but Joseph has spent enough time with his God. Now's the time to speak up. Proverbs 17, verse 27, the man of few words and settled mind is wise. Therefore, even a fool is thought to be wise when he is silent. It pays him to keep his mouth shut. That's scripture. I wonder how rich I would be today if I'd have just kept my mouth shut. It says it pays him. See, we have a world that's screaming and yelling today. We have a world full of experts, debaters, and sophisticated know-it-alls. We have very few sages who have lived it out, who are humble, who know when to speak, what to say, and how to say it. People understand there's a time to speak and a time to listen. What you feel is right, church, will change as you get older. Oh, man, I could scream when I was in my 20s, but I wished I wouldn't have. Right? Everyone wants a crowd, yet nobody has a mic. So they just scream all the louder. Joseph's voice is about to go from a voice in the desert, a voice in the wilderness, to a, and from a voice in the prison to the voice that will save a country because he walks humbly before his Lord. And finally, the final point is faithful in the little will cause faithful in the much. We say it a lot around here, that when we're faithful with a little, God can trust us to be faithful with a lot. He can truly count on us. Faithful in the little, faithful with much. A young man who cleans up, who takes responsibility, who has a great posture in what he does, can be trusted with much. Look, it, it's the same for women. A young woman we see it happen here, rise up through the ranks who we give a little and, and all of a sudden they're trusted with, entrusted with much, not just through the church, but, but really through a spiritual promotion. Well, I could put names to it. Riley, Callie, we, we just run on down the list. Eloise. It's not just for men, but right here we're talking about Joseph, right? And I'm just speaking about Joseph because watch what happens. He's been faithful in the little. Now he's about to be faithful with much. Verse 34, Joseph states, let Pharaoh appoint commissioners over the land to take a fifth of the harvest of Egypt during seven years of abundance. They should collect all the food of these good years that are coming and store up the grain under the authority of Pharaoh to be kept in the cities for food. This food should be held in reserve for the country to be used during seven years of famine that will come upon Egypt so that the country may not, so that the country may not be ruined by the famine. Did you notice something? That Joseph does not hesitate to tell Pharaoh what he needed to do. 
If this had been me, if you if you know anything about me and every one of the staff will verify this to you and for you, when they come up with an idea, they'll tell you the first thing I have to say is what? Have you put it on paper? I, I don't need this stuff floating out here. I need to see it here. And then we can pray over it. So had it been me standing before Pharaoh, I would have probably said, uh, Pharaoh, let me pray over it over the night. Let me put it on paper. Let me run it by the staff, the pastors, the elders. Um, let me, let me kind of see how I'm feeling on the inside as well. And, and, and Pharaoh, uh, let me come up with an illustration. I can probably come up with some type of word picture to, to talk to the people how this should be laid out. That's a problem I have. Sometimes it's a good one. Sometimes it's not so good. But I always say if it's not on paper, it's not going to happen. I mean, the Lord wrote it down, right? And so, so here, but, but notice something. If you watch Joseph, Joseph knows immediately. I'm standing before the king. I already know what needs to happen. I've interpreted the dream, and this is how you need to do it. This is exceptional leadership for a young man because immediately he starts with delegation, right? He doesn't say, Pharaoh, let me go pray about it. Let me make an outline. Let me look at some things. Let me look at how many cities you got and how far out there dispersed. That's not what he says. He says, get some commissioners, take a fifth of the produce, store it up, have it in the cities, meaning that have it throughout all the cities within the land. It's excellent leadership. How does he know? Listen, church, because he's done it before. He's been faithful in the little. Now he can be entrusted to be faithful with much. Excellent leadership. He already knew because he's done it before. He watched over his brothers for his dad, and the scripture says he told his dad the truth. He watched over Potiphar's house. He oversaw the prison. He was faithful in the little, wherever he was, and now he could be trusted with a country. He already knew how to do this because he had done it on much smaller scales. Listen, faithful in the little. I can't stress this enough. Faithful in the little. God can trust you to be faithful with much. Church, if he would have seen himself as less than God's purpose, he would have served no purpose other than the purpose of the world. And it's true for us as well. We've got to ask the question sometimes. We ask the question if God only knew. The question is if we only knew. If we would take God-like principles, we'd run not only the United States of America, we would rule the world in a, in a godly way. We would serve the world to come to know Christ. Excellent leadership is what Joseph had because it's what Joseph had done in his past. It's what promoted him for his future, faithful in the little, faithful with a lot. God's story was written through Joseph's promotion. Do you think he wants you in his story? Church, of course he does. You wouldn't be here today if you weren't called to be in his story. Listen to me, history. The little girl who said, we don't need to know history. We just need to have the power, the will to change it. <sighs> Dangerous to teach our children those things. We are to write the word of God. The scripture is clear on our children's minds, on their hearts. That's historical because God wants us to be a part of his story, history forever. Because what we do is eternal. It's not just temporal. Our posture before the king is so important for our promotion in this life. And God so desires to promote us, church. Would you please stand? There's a promise to those who would walk humbly before the Lord. It's okay, church, to say, I can't. It's okay to say, we can't apart from God, because we can't. But in Him, there are no limits to what can be accomplished. But it must be done His way with the correct posture in our life. Because the wrong posture will disqualify you. Listen, the wrong posture now is disqualifying churches. I don't have time to chase that one. Churches are splitting right, right and left. Look, this is why we as a church have to know who we are. Life-giving, Christ-manifested, Spirit-filled, Bible-teaching church. It's not left up to interpretation because then if it is, if it is, then we'll worship the creation over the creator. In Romans 1, that becomes a problem. So church, these principles, I want to encourage you 
to apply these principles to your life and watch God promote each and every one of us to a level of influencing a nation that needs to come back to its God, to influence a world that needs to know its God. I'm going to ask ask if the altar team would make their way forward at this time. We want to thank those of you online who joined us for worship and for the message this morning. We want to call everyone to a place of repentance, a place of understanding where we are in culture, where we are in life, and most importantly, where we are in our God. Have the correct posture, and you'll hear Him speak to you, and He will give you a dream for you and for others. Father God, thank you for this, your word. Continue to grow us up and grow us out. In the name of Jesus, our Lord, amen.